All right, good morning. Yes, How's we everybody were, doing? <laughs> we weren't sure if it's going to be, everybody's going to be here and it's going to be full or if it's going to be empty, so we're really excited to see everybody here today. And um, since we're already introduced, I'm Pamela. And I'm Ricardo. Um, so today we want to talk to you about, um, share with you some of our thoughts that we called around human-centeredness of anything uh, in a time of AI amplified business metrics. And the reason we phrased it this way is we're going to talk about engaging, how to engage in what we see are inherent challenges to some of the um, practices that Rory was just now talking about um, at a time when we are being asked to engage with and adopt new technologies faster than we can think, uh, think about the consequences of them. Which gets us to a topic that... Um, may I have yours? Yes. Ha. There you go. There we go. It gets us to a topic that uh, Ricardo and I have actually talked about before, um, which is unintended consequences. We first talked about it before the pandemic when we were both working in mobility. Um, Ricardo was working with uh, Ford and self-driving cars, and I was working with Deliver Hero and uh, spending quite a bit of time on urban, uh, urban impact of some of our scooters um, and mobility tools. We also spent some time talking about the impact of social media and some of the things that we really didn't foresee. Um, and today, we really want to be talking about what we anticipate will be unintended consequences that we can't quite grapple with, with the emergence of large language models and generative AI. AI has been around for quite a long time, but it seems to have come full force this spring with the launch of gen generative uh, with, of, um, GPT. Um, and, uh, it, but in a poll, when we talked about uh, to, of a thousand businesses to understand what they think about AI and where they see it, 67% said they envision AI to be an influential driver for their innovation practices this year. So it's here, and it came on us really quite quickly. So before we really get into some of the material we want to share with you, we want to have um, asked the audience some participatory question. And rather than raising hands, which is impossible for us to see, I'm going to ask you to stand up if the question applies to you. Um, so how many of you have been asked to integrate AI in your roadmaps two years ago? If anybody was asked, was working already on AI two years ago, can you stand up, please? I see one person, a couple people. A couple people? Yep. Oh, cool. If you stand up, it's easier for us to see you, please. Um, so, and then how about the last year? In the last year, please stand up. Please stand up. It's good. It's morning. We're still fresh. All right. How many of you have been asked to work on AI or integrate in AI in the last six months? All right. Cool. This yeah. is what, but roughly what we anticipated. Especially in the last six months, um, really AI has come to the forefront. Thank you very much. You can sit back down. Um, but it's really here and it's really coming with quite a bit of uh, momentum. And the velocity in which we're being asked to adopt this technology is part of what concerns us. So we want to come back to a question we're going to bring up a couple of times, which is the question we wanted to ask us and ask you is what is within our power? Uh, to work responsibly with Gen AI and large language models at a time when we're being asked to adopt these technologies faster than we can anticipate the consequences. The reason we care about it, I want to come back to Rory's point about our human-centered practices. Um, I think this is why we're here. We all care about developing products that make a difference to people's lives in a positive way that also impact the business because they really are effective and, and better than the normal. Um, but uh, this human-centeredness is a bit at risk when we are working at a time when we are being asked through the fast adoption of AI to actually be less thoughtful because we don't have as much time. And we're doing this while the businesses have expectations that we can be driving business impact um, and efficiencies and also drive more revenue. So this is where we see the tension between what we care about and the forces that are at work from, from the business perspective. And what we do see, and I think this resonates a little bit with what Rory was saying, is even though we care about human-centeredness, 
our agility, however much it's practiced in all of our permutations, um, is really forcing us to think about work in two-week increments and to focus on MVPs and launch Happy Pass. But we rarely ever have a chance to go back and actually do it right or fix the things that we launched. So this is where we see the tension, and we see it accelerating now with AI, because here the expectations are so high on the business side um, that we will be driving this efficiency through automations um, and that we will be actually affecting the business positively through our innovation practices, leveraging this technology. And this is the tension that we want to keep addressing when we come back to the question we were asking earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> so just to, to give a little bit of context of why we are in, in this um, acceleration, let's look at some, some numbers to see how global this trend is. It's not only about in this room. So in 2022, according to the Stanford AI Index, the uh, global investment for uh, AI-related projects was around almost $92 billion. And it's, uh, according to Goldman Sachs, it's going to reach $200 billion by 2025. And it makes sense because the revenue that came from those projects and other projects that were already going hit something around $51 billion last year. And it's going to increase exponentially between 2025 and 2027. Um, and in terms of not only uh, corporate businesses, but also startups, there are 14,000 registered U.S. startups related to AI um, and 58,000 globally. So you can see how this, this whole notion of, of, the, of, the, of a huge sector of the industry in, ma in many areas being all in uh, to adopt AI, it's something that only is going to accelerate more. And what that means to us is that we um, are going to hear more pressure to create those MVPs, more pressure to create those, those happy paths and to, to apply you know, faster launches to, uh, to market. But at the same time, and Pamela talks about the, the tension with business, there is a tension with the speed of technology that you are all aware of. And it, it is because the technology is delivering in solving some incredible, very complex problems that we haven't been able to solve before. So I wanted to walk you through a couple of examples that connect to these unintended consequences that we want to, to talk about, but that are very well known today. So you might have heard of them. Um, and the first example that I wanted to share with you is that of um, AlphaFold, which is a database developed by uh, Google's DeepMind. And AlphaFold is solving a problem that is, I don't know, 50 years old, something like that, of understanding and cataloging protein structures. And understanding these structures is really good for pharma, because that allows them to uh, find new products and new treatments and launch them in market. And AlphaFold started with 100,000 structures known to science back in 2016. Um, and in just a couple of years, they actually jumped to catalog something around 200 million uh, protein structures using AI, which is basically close to the number of proteins that are known to science today. And what that means to products is that um, there was this, uh, this startup in Silico Health that uh, partnered with the University of Toronto, and they were trying to find a new um, approach to cure a type of liver cancer, and it only took them 30 days to find the first viable um, prospect to drive to experimentation, which is an exponential acceleration from the months and years that have taken to get to, to these candidates. And we believe that this is an example of how the technology can be used responsibly, because even if the acceleration is exponential, the, the, the scientific and the technical teams on all sides of this conversation have tried to keep to the processes set by the governments and set by the uh, scientific industry. Um, but not all applications, and you, have, you all have heard uh, different uh, points of view in the news, not all applications of AI are free of problems. And face recognition is one that has been um, not only controversial, but also very well publicized. One of the cases that we wanted to bring to you was this of uh, Portia Woodruff, who is suing the Detroit Police Department for wrong, wrongful um, arrest. And what happened was um, that the police department uh, used the, uh, their face recognition system using this mock shot from 2015. Um, and they used this information and proceeded with, with little corroboration to arrest Portia. 
and they, 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 they were um, fault in, this, in the steps that they were followed, both from the system, not looking to see if there, there was more recent data, for example, her driver's license picture from 2021. And, and the police took that, that information and didn't corroborate details, like for example, um, when they look at the, uh, the footage uh, from, the, from the robbery that she was accused of, did, did they identify the suspect as pregnant and Portia was eight months pregnant. So if, if, the, if the police, the, the human side of this story, plus the system had taken you know, into consideration verifying the data, checking the data, then a mother and three kids would not have gone through you know, an, a, a very traumatic experience like they did. Um, another example that we wanted to uh, bring to you yes. is one of recommendations. And, and this, is a, this is a heartbreaking case. It's a, it's a very unfortunate case. Uh, and it's very well publicized. So Chase Nazca, the kid in the, in the picture that you see here, 16, dies by suicide February last year. And her, there, was, there was no apparent evidence cause of, uh, for, for this action. Her mother starts looking at the For You feed that Chase had in his TikTok and starts looking at an endless you know, hours of content that was sad and depressing and that, that uh, Chase was consuming on a daily basis. So this couple that you see here is suing TikTok for wrongful death. And because of these cases and other similar cases, um, a journalist like, for example, the Wall Street Journal um, started doing a study of uh, using bots to understand how, you know, how long would it take, for example, for a bot to replicate the, the, the type of feed that Chase had. And in the study, they found that the bot only took 36 minutes to turn that feed into 93% of content that was depressing and sad. Now, you can imagine the impact that this can have on a teenager who is in crisis, for example. Um, I think the, the story goes that Chase broke up with, with his girlfriend. And there, are, there is this combination of factors that get us to um, a very complex conversation on how to keep our teens safe while at the same time you know, growing at the exponential rate that TikTok has been growing. So let me do a quick recap. So um, we have started talking about how um, there is a tension between the business and, and being human-centric. And that this, this tension actually creates um, an oversimplified, we call it oversimplified product practices where we end up in MVPs that we might not be able to come back to to improve on happy paths that we have to create really quickly to launch to market. And this is only being increased by you know, um, the, the promise and the, and the technology around automation. And when you think about these examples that we just shared, uh, and we looked at a, at a big sample, we wanted to bring you these three because they highlight these five patterns that have, that have to do with unintended consequences so that we believe um, that we can start addressing or at least taking into consideration when we're creating new products. And, and the first factor is what we saw with AlphaFold. There is, there is definitely an increase on, on, on speeding to getting to products to market. And the systems, because they're self-learning, they're autonomous, they can actually get to scale really quickly. But when they're used with good processes and with good, um, with good um, uh, rules, they can be um, uh, taken into consideration to market in a, in a responsible way. But in contrast to that, it's really hard to talk about these decisions or having these considerations when um, there's only one metric that dominates all conversations and decisions. And in terms of TikTok, one of the core metrics is that of watch time. Um, and then if you think about the case of face recognition where Portia, there, there was this, this whole human and system understanding on if we bring data sets that are, uh, are not current, if we actually uh, use models that are not inclusive and we combine that with not checking the, the, the data, then we can create a lot of hurt for people who um, are, not, are not deserving it. And last but not least, one thing that I wanted to highlight on the case of Chase is that um, it is necessary to um, test the products over time because the, what it seems to be a bias in the algorithm to bring that sad and depressing content, it's something that, that cannot be tested just after one use. So that's something to take into consideration. And these are not new topics. I mean, we have heard about these topics you know, over time, 
but it is critical for us to really, really consider it because the, the, the machines are accelerating and, and actually starting to surpass those, those the capabilities in making decisions that, as we go forward, is going to be harder for us to track at the level of ability that we have today as humans. Thank you for those uh, examples, um, which are quite heartbreaking. Um, so we want to come back to uh, the question we asked earlier. So what is within our power to work responsibly with, gen, uh, with large language models and generative AI? And we wanted to reduce it to three things that we think we all can start to really work with in a way that allows us to start to anticipate what could be unintended consequences and really build towards a future uh, where the power, the positive power of artificial intelligence can be leveraged. So the first one we want to start with is really talking about data because all of the language models um, are really fed about from data. It's really the power. Um, and as Ricardo already pointed out, it's really important for us to look at what is the data? Who created it? How old is it? Is it the latest? And we can start to engage with that ourselves with what is the data that we're using. So at sum up, um, we use Azure from Microsoft uh, for some of our models, but we use all the internal data only for training these models. And then to the second point, which is, you know, think about the biases. What might be, you know, here? Do you see any biases? Um, in, the, in the results that you're getting that you should be careful about or aware of. So we work um, with people um, who check uh, our, our, the results of some of the reports that we're generating, for example, for risk and fraud purposes. Um, so it, it leverages AI for automation purposes, but we still engage with the data and the reports to ensure that what we're actually getting back is accurate and it doesn't reflect un unintended biases. And then the last one is really, there are some biases in industries. So if you're working in an industry that might be historically driven by biases, how do you really anticipate that, work with that? And there's a really particularly interesting example that I want to share in the lending business, which um, in the, especially in the States, I think has been suffering from certain types of biases, uh, which is a company called Fairplay. And they are, have, it's a startup from 2020. They have introduced a new concept, which is quite brilliant which is fairness as a service. And what they'd actually do is, uh, when you sign up with them, uh, they check your, your models and work with your models and train your models to remove biases that might be inherently in them. And the whole purpose and mission of the company is to ensure that it, the risk for the business continues to be appropriate and, and low, but that the biases that have been driving decision-making around lending or even financial services are removed and minimized so the customers can also really benefit from uh, a much fairer practice. The second one is uh, BART by Google, launched in the spring as an experiment. It allows anyone to, to really use BART to come up with some creative answers to creative questions. Um, we all know that some of the chat GPT technologies are still also hallucinating or creating some information that's not accurate. So they introduced um, a Google it button that comes back and says, hey, yes, we've actually verified this. This looks pretty right. It's what we see in the internet. Or it gives you a, a, an alert that says, okay, you might want to check it because we found something different. So it's a very a good way as an ex to have this extension to be able to continue to do dil due diligence on what we're getting back that we want to believe is fact a little bit like the police department, but that we should really check and verify that it's accurate. All right. So the second way that we think <clears throat> we, um, we suggest to engage is to talk about inclusivity. And we all have been talking about this for the past couple of years. It's an important topic, and we are very aware of it. But we think it's critical for something that Pamela already mentioned that I want to highlight again, which is the system builds on our biases. And bringing these, these voices to uh, product development and product creation, is, it, it's very important right now. And, and that's why our first recommendation when we think about inclusivity is think about the makeup of your team. And bringing folks maybe from other parts of the organization or bringing folks from other projects that can help you can be a way to um, gain perspective and they don't have to come uh, as full-time contributors. They can be advisors or they can be challengers to your team and make it in a more casual but also have a good cadence when you bring um, these other voices to the table. Um, and the, the second recommendation that, um, that surfaces as a pattern is to um, think about co-creating 
with uh, internal or external customers that have to do with uh, customer support or internal systems, especially when AI is applied to things like uh, managing resources, resource allocation, or payroll. I mean, we, we all heard um, the complaints from the rate share, uh, rate share drivers on how they call you know, the algorithm their digital boss that tells them where to go, how to work, and, and, and how much are going to get paid. Uh, when they are uh, using, you know, like when they're, when they're using the, the client for their, uh, for their activities. And what, what some um, articles refer to is that when you don't have a boss to actually talk to, you know, the factors that uh, can create problems related to that resource allocation or payments, then what happens is that these people get with their peers and through creativity and collaboration, fix the problems that, that this algorithmic ma uh, manager cannot fix. And that's something, an opportunity for us to explore. And last but not least, uh, we have talked already about um, testing your, uh, your product daily and do it over time to find those biases that cannot be found in, the, in one single use. So as examples of inclusivity, uh, we wanted to highlight uh, May Habib from uh, writer.com. Um, and uh, this is um, um, in the uh, Forbes AI 50 list. Um, and this company, in her vision as a CEO, has actually created these stats that you see here uh, for the makeup of the team. So 60% of the leadership is made, made, made by uh, women, and then 62% of the staff is, is conformed by women, people in, in, um, with different genders and races, but also she looks at factors like socioeconomic strata, which creates a, a real diversity of voices, and that gets translated into products. But it's not only the makeup of the teams that I wanted to um, highlight, same as with, with uh, Fair Play AI, uh, there are also tools that are coming out that might help us uh, gain um, insight into the data. Sony AI just published a paper related on how they want to expand um, how to analyze um, a skin color, visual, visual recognition, to move from just lightness and tone to include a second factor of hue. And this, this addresses not only the differences between different racial groups, but also the changes that happen over age, which creates a lot of perspective when we are trying to apply this to our product. Um, and last but not least, um, extending beyond you know, core use cases and scenarios, the functional part of the, of the product is very important to understand the human dimension, um, if you recall the, the examples that we brought to the table. And there are different factors um, that we wanted to highlight for you to take into consideration. And the first one came from um, a 1930s um, author, Robert Merton, who is one of the fathers of sociology, and he says that um, there are factors that constrain uh, folks, our teams, to um, look at long-term consequences, and, and they're here, and I'm going to read them because I remember them all. Um, ignorance, <clears throat> short-termism, values, uh, fear, error in assumptions that people make, and we think that now with AI, speech should also be a factor. And if you think about that, plus the motivations that um, companies but also individuals can have in terms of power, control, including and excluding some groups, that helps to create a much richer picture of the context in which the products will be created. And the idea is to have, <clears throat> to be able to have these conversations with the teams, capture those cases, and, and, and gain a point of view that we can bring back to um, our, our corporations on cases that we haven't uh, considered before. And as an example of a, of a cool tool that, that is one of our favorite tools to, uh, to bring these cases, uh, there is this um, tarot, um, tarot of tech cards that an agency in Seattle, Artifact, developed. And these, these, these cards contain really hard questions that are really useful for teams when they're trying to start uh, a product development. Like for example, who or what gets displaced when your product is, is successful, or what happens when a bad actor takes over your product when it's going to scale. So, um, so really recommend that, and we'll share a, a link um, in, uh, along with the, with the slides. So to wrap up, we want to come back to the question, what is within our power to work responsibly with this new technology? And we covered three areas. One was the our responsibility in working with the data and checking the data, and there's quite a bit that we can actually do to really make sure that 
the data that's fundamentally driving our products and services is accurate, correct, or unbiased. Inclusion, um, really important, uh, and there are a variety of ways that Ricardo explained in terms of how we can supplement our, the inclusivity of our teams. So we can bring different perspectives, either of our audience, of our customers, or even of our colleagues into a conversation. And the last one, which we also really believe is a muscle that we need to start to practice as product teams, is to think ahead. So even though we are working towards MVPs and we're talking about happy paths, to take the time and build, develop a practice with your teams to think about what could be other way, think, ways in which these tools that you're creating can have negative consequences. So to close, I um, want to come back to something really fundamental. Rory talked about it, we talked about it. We believe in human-centeredness, yet we're challenged at the speed of development. And while this is all true and we're, we're working at this tension point between the demands that are put on us um, and the speed at which we need to be working, we want to believe and we want to encourage you to engage now um, in a human-centered passion with the tools that we're suggesting or any others that you may have so that we can together create the future that actually is quite powerful and possible with artificial intelligence. Have I said everything? We debated this last this quote quite a bit last night. Um, we had very different perspectives, whether it was a good one to close with or not. Did, did I capture it? <laughs> I think it? so. I think the, the word that you need to remember is engage. This is the time. And we are those people who are engaging with this technology. It's our responsibility to create you know, the tools and the processes that will get us to the, the next step to use it responsibly. Thank you very much. All right, so let's talk about consent. You know, whose data can we use? And as an example, you know, did we ask Portia if you can use her photographer, photograph in the presentation? And where does the data go? And how can we make sure it doesn't harm? Yeah, that's, that's an ongoing conversation. I mean, in, in, in Portia's case, or I guess I should say in the, in the, in the data that the police uh, departments use in the United States, there is a provider uh, that is connected to 3,000 different police um, departments in, in the country, and they're getting sued because of that point of concern of data. They're, they have been doing a lot of um, scraping from social media to complete and to train the models, and we know how that is already biased. Right. So there is, there is definitely a, a push to make this consent clearer. Uh, and it's an ongoing conversation because, I mean, we hear how often people refer to how the legislation is going too slow compared to the development of data. And what, what I believe, and I think Pamela and I were talking about this last night and had discussions, is that um, uh, raising the cases and bringing the information and actually communicating what we see is very important. So it's not only about creating the product, but also telling these stories that bring, bring uh, clarity, you know, to what we should do. In the case of SumUp, because I brought it up, um, we, we, of course, we are, we are in Europe, we, we very much focus on being GDPR compliant, which is why we only use data that's internal and stays internal. Um, and uh, the, the data that's coming in, or the models that are coming in from Azure, we really are spending a lot of time making sure that there isn't any kind of in unintended bias you know, introduced through some of this external data. But this kind of, the, the staying really focused on the internal is one of the ways we can certainly drive the efficiencies that companies are looking for, but we're not introducing, you know, un unintended consequences. we're not leaking the data from our, our customers. Certainly, great answer. Um, I saw a really fun question in here about, do we feel like we need to upgrade our techniques when it comes to qualitative and quantitative research now that there's, you know, great advancements with LLMs and AI? Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Uh, do I was, you feel like we I was reading to... and I was like, wait, this doesn't, I don't see it. Yeah. Do we feel like as designers and uh, product teams, we need to upgrade our techniques when it comes to qualitative and quantitative research, given the big advancements we have in LLMs and AI? So yes, I mean, I think the, the qualitative and the quantitative is where we need to invest more time in. I mean, historically, you've worked in design for a long time, and I feel like that's become very reduced to, again, some very basic practices, um, and we need to reinvest in that interaction between what do we know quantitatively and how do we balance it with the qualitative insights that we can gain and, and really having that work quite closely together. And we see definitely in, in our practice, and I think in yours as well, that there's a real acceleration of looking at research and research data and quantitative information um, to actually help drive some of the decisions. 
Yeah, yeah one, like, one of the topics that because of time we couldn't address was this whole topic of the metrics and metrics development. But there is, there is a whole uh, opportunity for us to start developing, you know, what are the things that we're going to track that might bring yeah. some balance to those metrics that the business are trying. Exactly. Do you also see like AI actually being a part of how we conduct research? You've seen some companies <laughs> utilize AI to automate synthesis, things like this. Hopefully. <laughs> I, I'd love to have um, our head of research, Arno, actually answer that question um, because it, he, he believes that there's a lot of potential and, and we've, we've been super excited about it, but I think we're ways off um, from it being effective. So we're going to continue looking into it, uh, but it's not in the not yet. And I think I'm speaking the truth, Arno, um, at a point where we can really rely on, um, on, on AI as, as a way in which to accelerate all of our knowledge building. And there's quite a bit of interesting studies I even heard at the conference last week on just the lack of um, emotion and, and sort of this human dimension that is applied when AI models are, are basically just doing pure logic around language and words. Certainly. We have time for one more question. Um, I saw one earlier. So when it comes down to, to individual power, Right. Um, so a lot of the things we're talking about maybe are at the manager, director, executive level, how the teams are structured. But as an individual, what are techniques we can apply to make sure that you know AI-powered products are more ethical? What are our our own yeah, tools? Yeah. Like but this is what we wanted to bring up in the three examples that we shared um, because we we know, for example, with the data. You know, we are we're in this. We're being asked to use data. So what can we do? What questions do we need to be asking? What due diligence can we actually be doing in our own work um, to continue to drive some level of awareness and engagement? And we try to keep all of our three examples at that level of, of, of at least responsibility that it isn't an abstraction or it isn't just something ordained by executives, but it's something that we can do in our teams on a, on a day to day or on a weekly or some other kind of cadence um, that works for your teams. Yeah, that, that, that first step is to gain more awareness. I mean, how do you change your next study plan for research? How do you actually bring these voices that we were talking about? There are small steps that are very meaningful, and that is going to open uh, the road for uh, actions that would fit your company, that would fit your team. But gaining that awareness and taking that into consideration, that's the first step that we are recommending to the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you. If you have any more questions for Pamela and Ricardo, please find them. Let's give a big round of applause to Pamela and Ricardo. Thank you.